All righty. Um, so, um, so fun, fun. I have a little bit of background. Is that just on my end? Just on my end. So let's mute. I'm, I muted the, the fellow panelists just for now. And then whenever there's a there's a question, they'll unmute themselves because we're hearing a little bit of background noise. The only thing I'll say before I get we get right into it is that we have a, a lot of questions that typically come in. Sometimes we see upwards of 200 plus individuals and community members at this event, which is amazing. And that means sometimes we, do, we may not get to your question or we look through the questions and see some themes. And so when we ask your question, it may not be exactly word for word for what you said, because we see a bunch of people asking similar questions and sometimes we try to put them together as a theme. Um, so we hear you, we see you, um, and due to sometimes the uh, significant number of questions, we may not get to every single one. Um, but we have just a few questions that have come in now. And so don't hesitate to go ahead and start putting your questions into the Q&A. And also, if you hear, have any issues with the event, you can put in your concern there because that's the only way we'll know about it. Alrighty, so we're going to go ahead and get right into it. Dr. K, Rachel, and Dr. Cohen are going to provide some basic get some information around where we are with COVID-19, and then we'll get into your questions. Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. So just um, with the numbers, we are at 87,370 cases. We are averaging about 300 to 300 new cases each day. So we've definitely passed the peak and we are seeing a downward trend in our cases. Um, so that is good news. We are at 1,288 deaths. Um, by case rate, uh, it, this shows, our dashboard shows 21.6 uh, per 100,000. But I do need to note that according to the blueprint that um, the state sets up is what we follow in order to change our tier. And according to the state blueprint for this week, we are at 30.6 per 100,000 cases. The reason for the difference is that the, the state has a seven day lag and also um, they average over seven days, whereas um, for our dashboard, we uh, update it daily. So this is more updated and we look at uh, a shorter time frame of three days. So that's why we, there is a difference, but both of them are accurate. It's just that we are looking at different phases. A few things to point out um, as we are going through the vaccination, uh, this is very exciting that we are at this point where we can start talking about vaccinations. But we want to caution everyone that it will take many months before we actually uh, are able to vaccinate enough people to have an impact. So we continue to recommend that everyone continue to be uh, vigilant and follow all of the uh, protocols and guidelines that we have been following so carefully. So face covering, staying six feet uh, from other people who are not from your household, stay home if you're sick and avoid gatherings. And again, talking about gatherings, we know that uh, the Super Bowl Sunday is coming up and we are asking and imploring that everybody keep to their household and enjoy the, the game from their own home so that we don't see an, a surge as a result of people gathering in their homes. So um, I will stop there and I will let uh, Dr. Cohen uh, from UC Davis talk a little bit about the hospitalizations and treatment. And then uh, Rachel will talk about vaccinations. So, um, welcome everybody. Um, I, I will be pretty brief. Um, we are uh, seeing what Dr. Kassirie has uh, brought up already that the number of cases um, hospitalized at UC Davis is going down. Uh, one of the things that is sometimes lost in the idea that there, the number of new cases are going down is there are a lot of patients, particularly people who have been very sick, who remain in the hospital and remain in the ICUs for a very long period of time. 
So even though the number of people who have active COVID where we actually would maintain them in isolation precautions in the hospital have been going down and probably is about half as high as they were at our peak, maybe even less than half. The number of total patients is still quite significant and, um, and does require a lot of um, uh, work. And that's where some of the issues about ICU capacity and other things um, sort of lag behind the, the curves as they drop down. As far as therapeutics go, I think one of the things that we are really interested in is for particularly high-risk people who have not yet been vaccinated, um, who are not very sick, we have the availability of um, monoclonal antibodies, which I think people have heard about a little bit. And I do think that they have a significant ability to um, shorten duration of illness and may be able to prevent some people from getting sicker and ending up being hospitalized. And I think that um, there's a little bit of a disconnect between the ability of people to get treated um, in part because the, their physicians or other providers don't always know about it and they got to get us linked into um, service. And we're okay uh, providing the monoclonal to people who are not members of our um, UC Davis uh, health um, um, medical plan. So um, I think if, you're, uh, if you do end up getting sick, unfortunately, and um, particularly are older or have other underlying medical illnesses that may lead to um, more severe disease. Um, when you talk with your provider, please ask whether they can refer you over for monoclonals. We'll do a brief visit with you by video and clarify whether you would really benefit from the treatment and then we can get, get the treatment done. It's an IV that takes about two hours um, to get done. Um, between uh, running it in and watching you a little bit afterwards. Um, and it's a very efficient system. We have a clinic set up out in uh, Rancho Cordova to be able to um, take care of that. Um, and then we're also um, aggressively vaccinating. We've done really well with our frontline healthcare workers and um, we're starting to roll out into our patients as well. And we're all enthusiastic about getting people vaccinated. That's, uh, that's the great step forward. Um, so Dr. K, anything else you wanna add before we hop into the Q&A? I think Rachel, I was uh, hoping that Rachel would say a few words. Great, I know she may have had to hop off because of some internet oh, challenges, I but I got to turn it on. Okay. <laughs> Great. Hi, sorry, lots of uh, issues over here. <laughs> um, yeah, things are, uh, we've had a good week, I think with vaccinations, um, definitely seeing the numbers of uh, people vaccinated really start to increase now. Um, and we knew that that was going to happen uh, once we, um, you know, got our providers um, that we're working with really used to uh, this vaccine. Um, and we're seeing them really take off now and being able to do more and more numbers. Sorry, I'm still struggling with my computer. <laughs> um, but um, so I, I think it's been great. It's been fantastic. Uh, we're working really hard, still lots of work to do, um, but we have onboarded a lot of new providers this week. And we've had a couple of weeks of pretty steady vaccine allocation, which has allowed us to um, to continue to supply those providers with vaccine and to um, also um, work on getting Cal Expo um, up to speed uh, to where we want it to be. Um, so I think that's been fantastic. Uh, we did, I think we're doing about 800 there tomorrow and um, hoping to be up to 1200 a day in the uh, coming weeks uh, or, you know, I think in the next like 10 days. Um, 
So um, some challenges as well. The state is um, changing some systems that we're going to have to relearn uh, the registration system. We will be moving to a new system and that's kind of poses a, a new challenge, but we're going to work on it and get through it. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna hop off for one second and just try to fix the cord on this computer. <laughs> I had to switch to a different laptop and it's still giving me troubles, but I'm here and I'll be right back. That's great. Thanks, Rachel. All right, Dr. K, anything else before we move to Q&A? No, I think we can move to Q&A now. Okay, great. Um, Mike, would you mind pulling up on the screen the, the vaccine FAQ just so we can, I'm seeing a lot of questions about that. We can just have that up as a visual um, for a moment. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so um, the first question is, can adults with special needs be vaccinated at the same clinics that are offering 65 plus, or will they need to wait for specific clinics for their population? And this might be a good time if you want to talk about anything broadly related to the vaccination phases and where we are. Um, questions around vaccine are, are top of mind for many community members. Sure, so this graphic shows you a very good summary of what we're working on right now. We are still uh, able to take appointments for those in the healthcare industry. So those were phase 1A, uh, tier one through three. Um, you see them there. And then we re most recently started on phase 1B. And right now we're starting with persons age 65 and older and then um, law enforcement and emergency services. We are aware that at some point the, there will be a special group for those with disabilities, but um, the state has not given us the, the final uh, prioritization on that. So if someone does have disabilities, if they belong to one of the tiers that we have right now, they can sign up and get vaccinated either they're over the age of 65 or they belong to one of the occupational sectors that are listed. Great, thank you. Um, we have a community member that is asking, it is known that there are several types of COVID-19 variations in the US recently. Can you tell us more about these types of COVID variations and how to prevent getting them? So I will, um try to be reasonably clear with this. So just to remind everybody, the virus that causes COVID-19 is called SARS-CoV-2. These virus, it's a, what's called an RNA virus, that's its genetic material. And part of the way RNA viruses survive is they mutate, they make changes. And if the changes are good, they stick around. And if the changes are bad, um, that change disappears. And so what's happening with these variants is this is sort of the natural course of having a large number of people infected with an RNA virus. And some of these variants make the virus more contagious. Um, and some may actually make it more of a serious illness. Those variants um, have a, a benefit, right? They're, they become more fit than their parents. And so they end up becoming a significant percentage of the population. So I think as these variants show up, they may become more and more the dominant population. Currently in California, we don't have a ton of data but we have some information to say that the so-called B117 variant, which was present in the United Kingdom at first, um, is circulating within California, um, including in Northern California. And then there are two other variants that are being named the West Coast variants, which seem to be more frequent throughout California, again, more in Southern California than up North, um, but up here as well. Um, one of the concerns obviously is that 
Um, these are not the viruses that the vaccines were designed to prevent uh, infection with. That's not very good English, but that's the best I can do. And so um, uh, the, um, uh, so as these things change, we don't know how well the vaccines are gonna work. Now, based on some studies that were published last week and also um, press releases, it appears that our current vaccine still works pretty well against the, the B117, the British variant. Um, there's a variant uh, in South Africa that it doesn't seem to work as well against. And um, that has been seen in South Carolina, but until we start doing a lot of testing to determine how widely spread these variants are, we're not really gonna know. And I think we have to assume they're everywhere until we find out differently. And that's why even after people are being vaccinated, we're still suggesting that they wear masks and that they distance and that they limit the number of people that they're um, close to and that they uh, wash their hands because all of those strategies worked relatively effectively with no vaccine. So if the vaccine is only 50% effective against these variants, you still get the added benefit of the vaccine, plus you're already doing the other things which keep you from getting infected. It was a long answer, but I think that it covered most of the points that were asked. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Um, so another um, question we have here is around, you know, folks that have already had COVID. And, um, you know, this community member is wondering if they can stay in contact or stay close to people who have recovered from being infected with COVID. Is that safe? Yeah, so so there's there's some limited evidence now that suggests um, this is something I just saw this morning that suggests that somebody who has already had COVID who gets vaccine um, gets a big boost res uh, response, just like getting the second vaccine for people who had never had COVID. And so people who've had COVID are probably um, immune it looks like they're probably immune for at least eight months. Um, and so, um, but the vaccine provides a boost and potentially provides a longer course of immunity. And we're still recommending two doses for people who've had COVID, but it looks like one dose might be enough actually, at least based on these very um, preliminary data. So, um, so it is safe to be around somebody once they've recovered, they're not gonna be transmitting anymore. And um, you're gonna be following all your um, non-pharmacologic measures anyhow. Okay, thank you. So, um, you know, what about the average person that's not high risk, and is just living in the Sacramento area, when can they expect to get the vaccine? Yeah, so, you know, uh, we don't have an exact date. I wish we could uh, tell you, and it's really gonna depend, uh, and we talked about this on, on other calls, um, on two things, uh, the availability of vaccine and how quickly the manufacturing of vaccine scales up or whether other vaccine, um, options uh, come onto the market. And then also just the numbers that we have in each of those phases and tiers. And I think my computer wasn't working, but maybe you went through the, I don't know if you went through the diagram, but um, you know, Sacramento County had a lot of people in phase 1A. We're still working our way through that and kind of dipping into phase um, 1B, but it's gonna take some time. So it's hard, it's hard um, to give an exact date. You know, one thing that's sort of good news is that I saw today that um, Johnson & Johnson has put in their application for an EUA. Um, it's a single dose vaccine. And um, uh, we'll see, it'll probably end up, uh, hopefully it'll end up at the um, FDA next week. Um, 
but surely within a couple of weeks, um, we should know whether it's uh, given emergency use authorization. And that'll easily increase the supply um, at least by a third, if not more. That's great, that's great to hear. Yeah. <laughs> um, is Sac State Student Services at 6000 J Street a vaccine site? Yes, it is. It is one of our uh, sites. Right now, they are still focusing on pe people over the age of 65. But as we um, advance through the different tiers and priority groups, they will be uh, servicing others as well. So I am 75, and I see on the county website that individuals in my age group are being vaccinated, but I cannot find a way to make an appointment. You want to do that one, Rachel? Sure. Um, and sorry if there's noise. I've got some kids <laughs> doing stuff out there. Um, so I would recommend if you're having trouble finding an appointment, if you've tried through your physician um, to go to our um, county website and we have a survey on our vaccine um, website where you can enter your name and your contact information. And we are, um, oh, there it is. And um, you'll be able to fill out a survey that um, gives us your name and contact information and that way we can reach you. And we do work through that survey as we, you know, as sites become available and we have appointments available we send out invitations to those clinics uh, based off of the survey. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so any, any thoughts on folks jumping ahead of the lines and somehow getting the vaccine, even if they're not in the designated tier or group? Are there strict guidelines being followed to assure only those who really qualify are being vaccinated? Um, I'll, I'll take that one. We, we try the best that we can, especially with uh, occupation sectors. We have points of contact that we use to be able to um, send information to. Our web link is not public. And the reason we did not make it public is so that we can have some control about who has access to it. So for example, when we are looking at first responders, we do have contacts with the first responders, so we'll send that link to them, and then they will have their members uh, sign up for the appointments. Um, it is more challenging if you're looking at the 65 and over, but we can use uh, date of birth as a way of uh, making sure that we have the right people um, that are signing up for the appointments. Um, and, and so sometimes it, it is difficult to, to know for sure, because sometimes we do have to depend on what somebody says if they work at a certain place. But for the most part, this is the way that we're able to try and make sure that we are getting to the people that we're targeting. Awesome, great. Um, so can you talk a little bit about um, California in the, in the vaccine distribution space? So we have a community member who's wondering why is California so behind most of the US in administering the COVID vaccine? California is one of the largest states. It's also very diverse. And also our medical system, um, we do have um, 61 local health jurisdictions and each of them does operate a little differently because we are serving a very diverse population. So um, uh, as Rachel mentioned at the beginning, it was a little slow starting off with the vaccinations, but it has ramped up a lot. And so I'm very confident that we're going to catch up. Uh, it, it's just a matter of time and also being able to get to the different groups that, that we need to reach. Great, thank you. Um, and we know some folks are hearing some background noise for speakers. We'll just have folks speak up and we appreciate you understanding that there's different things that come up in, in uh, online webinars. Um, so we have so a lot of questions about teachers. Um, and wondering, you know, what's what's happening with schools? Uh, when when do you think teachers are going to get the vaccine? Well, I'll start off and then I'll let Rachel say a few words also. Um, we've been just wanted to point out that we've been working very closely with schools from the very start. We've been working with them on protocols on school reopenings on school sports 
Um, so we, our communication has been almost on a weekly basis. And so as the vaccine rollout started, we started having conversations with them about what would happen when it comes to their turn. Um, we, of course, are following the state guidelines in terms of the priority groups. And that has changed a little bit, as uh, Rachel pointed out. Um, but now with the information that we have, uh, teachers are in phase 1B. We are still finishing off the um, first responders and then the next ones will be the teachers. Our hope is that we will be able to get to that um, mid-February. And I know that um, there are a lot of people who are very anxious to help us with that. We've had contact with all of the hospitals within Sacramento and they, they are willing to set up clinics. We also do have uh, sites at Cal North State and Sac State uh, campuses and uh, also our uh, Cal Expo site. So there'll be several sites where uh, teachers can sign up. So um, Rachel, I don't know if you have something else to add to that. Yeah, I would just add that, yeah, the, we have a lot of partners offering and I think we will have some, you know, every week our options get better and our partners get better at what they're doing and they're learning. And like I said, getting um, faster at distributing vaccines. So when we're ready to, to move to teachers, I think we'll have some, uh, some more options and some good options. Thank you. Um, so we have a question here for you, Dr. Cohen. Um, so during the previous meeting, Dr. Cohen did not suggest using two masks, but most experts, such as Dr. Fauci, do recommend it. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, in the last two weeks, things have changed a little bit. And I'll tell you what the basis of this um, is. So the way masks work, first of all, the masks don't filter out virus. They filter out droplets that the viruses are in. The viruses are too small. They go through anything. So, um, so the masks filter out these droplets. The way that they work is the masks have mesh put together and basically they set up an obstacle course for the droplets to get either out or in. And, um, but, you know, a lot of these um, loop masks that we have, they don't, they don't fit quite right, right? They have big gaps in the side or up top, right? Your glasses fog up, so you know that there's stuff getting out. And so one of the arguments about using a, a cloth mask over the top of that is besides making more layers and, and making the obstacle course more for the droplets, it also helps seal that surgical mask onto your face. All the data come from physics labs, basically, um, and engineering labs. They don't come from clinical information, but with the more transmissible types of virus floating around, I think that the um, recommendations by people like Dr. Fauci have been with an abundance of cautious caution and thinking, you know, might as well do the best you can do. And um, I think that that's the basis of it. There, there's no new clinical information. Masks still work, but I think that you want to get a better seal than you can get um, with most of these. Um, everyone has modifications to try to tighten them to their face. Um, but you always have gaps. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so, you know, there are some questions about barriers to getting the vaccine. And so we have two questions coming in about some barriers. Um, and Rachel, folks are, folks are asking to hear from you. Um, so will people always have to have an ID in order to get a vaccine? My parents don't have any ID identification from the US. And another question kind of similar, which is that many seniors don't use computers. How can they get an appointment for the vaccine? So let's talk a little bit about how public health is addressing some of those barriers. Yeah, so um, the identification, you know, has certainly been helpful when we're working in the industry-based sector, um, and most people have something they can show that um, 
that shows that they belong in that sector. And we do ask when people make an appointment and we ask our partners to, to request the same, that people bring some proof uh, that they belong in that industry. As we move into age-based, that gets easier. Most people have an ID um, that, that can show their age. And I think that that's um, you know, generally um, pretty easy to come by. Um, I think if you know, I think if you have an appointment and you you believe that you belong there and you come, you know, I think that you'll be able to be vaccinated. Um, and then, what was the second question about barriers with computers? Oh yes, yes. No, we do understand that that's real, um, and we are working towards uh, increasing the number of people um, and hope to have a, I think a team that can assist with the um, phones to um, help people make. Um, appointments on because the systems that were given by the state are all online scheduling systems and we recognize that that's not going to work for everyone so um, we have been still working mostly in the industry based sectors but as we're moving um, into uh, the 65 and over uh, we recognize that that's an issue and we'll have um, more people to be able to assist with that and hopefully have a team that can um, where, where people can call in essentially and have the assistance to make the appointment. Thank you, Rachel. Um, all right. So, you know, once folks are uh, folks that are looking to get the vaccine um, are wondering about adverse reactions to the vaccine, you know, after they get it. Are is there any concern um, about adverse reactions that you can talk to the community a little bit about? Well, I can take. I can take at least the beginning of that. So um, the number of ad long-term adverse reactions um, is hard to tell right now. It appears that it's going to be none um, or very few. Um, but you have to realize that the initial vaccine trials with that Pfizer and Moderna started doing um, and their large phase three trials occurred over the summer. So they've only got six months at most where they've been following people to determine whether they see any long-term effects. But most of the side effects are seen early, um, within the first several days after getting vaccine. Um, and there's not really a heck of a lot that is showing up late. So I'm not expecting um, long-term effects. All of the vaccine trials ask people to um, participate for two years. Um, and so the expectation is that that data will be available. Um, but I think I saw in the Q&A box as well that someone was asking about what percentage of people end up with, with long COVID where they're sick for a long period of time. And those numbers are also not totally clear, but I can tell you that even within our healthcare workers who have been infected, um, we have um, double digit numbers of people who have been out for months. And so um, I, again, I think when you balance the risks and benefits, um, it's a little bit of an unknown regarding really long-term vaccine data but we do know what um, long-term and long COVID looks like. And we don't really have a good clear idea as to when that's gonna end either. So when patients are ultimately gonna get back to where they were. Great, thank if you. If I may add to that just a little. Um, one of the things that uh, for those who sign up for vaccination, you should expect that after you get your shot that you will be asked to remain on site for a minimum 15 minutes while you're being monitored, just to make sure that you don't have any adverse um, effects. And also you will be asked questions about if you have any history of any severe allergic reactions and people like that will be asked to stay for a longer time. Um, and the other thing also to note is sometimes people do confuse adverse effects with, with side effects. And uh, the difference is that the side effects are a lot more frequent 
they are much milder. They uh, last for just a very short period of time. It might be a few hours or one or two days. And actually those uh, side effects are um, uh, actually show that your body is actually starting to mount an immune response. So these could be things like uh, a sore soreness at the site where you got the injection. Uh, some people might describe it as feeling like their arm is heavy. Uh, you might feel some uh, fatigue that lasts maybe a few hours. You might get a headache or low-grade fever, but all of these are things that will last for a short time and will um, will just pass off. So those are things that people should expect. So side effects are different from the adverse events, which are much more severe. Thank you, Dr. K. Um, that's helpful as people kind of think about uh, weighing what their decisions are and, and what those effects look like. Um, so uh, Jeffrey's wondering, a cohort of friends has been immunized. What precautions do we need to take if we want to get together? That's a good question that we've been asked quite a lot. In fact, oftentimes what we're asked is, if grandma who is in a long-term care facility was vaccinated, can we visit grandma? Can we hug grandma? Um, those are all very important um, questions. We are still a ways away from getting to the point where we have what we describe as herd immunity, where enough people in the community are vaccinated to be able to control the virus and stop transmission. But for example, a group where they have been vaccinated, yes, there are things that they can do like being able to get together, but we still recommend that they take the appropriate precautions in terms of wearing a face covering, hand washing, um, and also uh, making sure if they do have any symptoms that they stay home. You know, I get a lot of those questions too, uh, particularly from people at work now that we've had a lot of our healthcare workers who have been vaccinated. But you know, the one thing that you can think about um, is about 5% don't respond to the vaccine. So if you have a group of 10 or 20 people, there's a possibility that in that group, there are people who don't respond to the vaccine. And one of the other questions that I saw in the chat was whether the vaccine absolutely prevents infection or whether it prevents disease. And I think that um, the data suggests that it is pretty efficient at preventing infection, but it doesn't totally prevent infection. And we don't know totally for Moderna or Pfizer, but we do know um, in a, a pre-publication of AstraZeneca's study that out of about 9,000 people in, uh, in England, about 130 of them uh, had asymptomatic infection. So it's a small percentage. It's only about one or 2% but there's still a percentage and then there's our people who may not be immune. So I think until we know better, and then we already talked about the variants. And so with all the, those things put together, I think it still makes sense to feel more comfortable about getting together, but doing all the right things um, in relationship to masking and trying to keep some distance. Alrighty, thank you. Um, so to, to answer your question, Jeffrey, it seems like there's some, some things to consider <laughs> when you're making those decisions and, and doing so safely. Um, so we have a community member who is wanting to know about dialysis patients. Um, and will they be moved to the top of the Sac County vaccine list? Um, we lost our beautiful niece recently. I'm so sorry for your loss. And I know of another dialysis patient that has died from COVID-19. Rachel, do you want to respond to that? Sure. Yeah, we're working uh, closely with each of the dialysis centers. Um, and we did initially uh, 
very early on their staff were vaccinated and we are working with them with their patient population. So some of them are providers in our allocating system and that's easy. We can um, just send them vaccine you know, through the ordering system. Um, other providers uh, we're working really closely with where we have a system where they can come and pick up vaccine from us each morning and uh, work with their patients. So we're working towards that uh, actively right now. And is Cal Expo a vaccination site and is it drive through? Yeah, yes. Cal Expo is a vaccination site. Um, it's, it is run by uh, our county vaccine program and uh, we have a terrific group of people working out there working really hard. Um, and so we, we use it primarily for first responders right now. And as we finish up that tier, we'll, we'll move on to another um, it is invitation only, and um, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, we've been slowly but steadily ramping up uh, the numbers that go through, and I think tomorrow will be uh, over 800 uh, in one day. Oh, that's a lot of people. <laughs> that's great. Um, so Larry says Sacramento seems to be the slowest county in California in vaccinating seniors. Most states are well ahead of California. I feel like we seniors are at the end of the line here in Sacramento County. Actually, we are prioritizing uh, seniors. It, it did take a little bit of time because um, we were following the state prioritization list and initially seniors or those over the age of 75 were in phase 1B. And then because of the recognition of the risk of severe disease and death for those over the age of 65, the state made the decision to change and asked us to start prioritizing those over the age of 65. It took a little bit of time for us to make the shift because we are still dealing with relatively uh, limited supply of vaccine. But right now we are vaccinating those over uh, 65 and the way that we're doing it in Sacramento is that um, our partners, the hospitals, the clinics and the pharmacies and the sites that I mentioned before, Sac State and Cal North State are now available for appointments for people over the age of 65. We're still keeping um, Cal Expo mainly for the occupation sectors. So as uh, Rachel mentioned right now, we are working through the first responders and then we will include teachers after that. But definitely we do recognize the risk of COVID-19 for people over, over the age of 65 and uh, we're providing vaccinations. Thank you. So if people start to get vaccinated, which, which they've started to do, how often should asymptomatic, and if you could tell us what asymptomatic means, whoever's going to answer this question, folks get tested? So, so first of all, asymptomatic testing is um, testing someone who um, feels fine. Okay, and um, Asymptomatic testing programs are not widely available to my knowledge uh, within this area, but there are some. And um, for example, at, at UC Davis on the Davis campus, they're offering um, asymptomatic testing to the entire city of Davis um, in addition to the campus community. Um, that was funded through grants and, and it's obviously a much smaller community than, um, than Sacramento. Um, so the idea of asymptomatic testing is identifying maybe the 40 or 50% of people who are infected that never get sick, um, but still could transmit. And it would be, uh, it would allow people to self-quarantine and uh, avoid transmitting to other people. Um, we are not discontinuing doing asymptomatic testing after vaccinating people because of all the issues that we've talked about, which are still um, 
allowing the health departments to suggest that we maintain all of our um, safety practices. Um, and so until we know differently, I think that it's still a good idea, um, particularly for people who are in high risk occupations uh, or uh, in, co in communal settings where they can tr pass things around, um, particularly if their populations are not fully vaccinated. And um, Dr. K, do we have any capacity within our current testing program right now? Uh, do we have room for people to get tested? Yes, we do. We have, is it 11 or 13 sites now? Uh, we have 11 current sites plus two Optum search sites. So yeah, okay. So both answers are correct. <laughs> uh, but yes, we do have several sites within the community where people can get uh, tested. It is free of charge to the public. And we do encourage that people continue to get tested. Definitely, if you're exhibiting symptoms, we, uh, we recommend you get tested. As um, uh, Dr. Cohen mentioned, also for those that are in high risk occupations, they should get tested. Um, and I know that also for teachers, especially those that are having in-person learning, we are off also offering it to, uh, to those teachers so that they can voluntarily sign up to get tested. We do have capacity um, in, in every one of those sites. And I think, uh, Liz, are you sharing the sites? Yes, there you go. Mike, we'll go ahead and put this information in the chat. Um, we do have capacity at all of our sites, um, significant capacity, and you can walk up or sign up before. Um, so don't hesitate to use that resource and it'll, it'll be put in the chat. All right, so we have some more questions about vaccines and how they affect various groups. And so, you know, we have some folks who want to know about when are vaccines going to be tested for children and how does vaccine kind of this planning affect families and children? So the initial clinical trials with, um, uh, with Moderna and Pfizer vaccine are either in the process of finishing their planning or they're actually starting to roll out. So um, there will be um, data on kids um, coming up. You know that the Pfizer vaccine is approved for up for 16 and over. So there are a smaller group of teenagers that are included within the Pfizer uh, emergency use authorization. But the kids will um, uh, will follow. Um, you know, I, I'm interested to hear what Dr. Casirier says about this too. But it does seem like kids are less likely to transmit, unlike seemingly every other viral infection, where kids um, pass things along to um, uh, us old people. Um, I think. Uh, uh, this seems to be one of those circumstances where kids are not the middle of all the transmission, right? It's the, it's the 20 to 50 year olds that seem to be the big, um, big driver of our um, uh, pandemic right now. Right, that's right. The uh, children have rem the um, case rate and number of cases in uh, children has remained very low um, and uh, about 60% of our cases are actually in young adults, 18 to 49. So um, you're right in what you're saying. Um, I think the risk that people have to be careful about is that there, has, there is some evidence that children can transmit even though it's not at the same rate and so there is concern, especially for households that are multi-generational. And that's been part of the concern with being able to open uh, schools up. I think there's more uh, comfort and, and confidence now that we are able to do it 
but still with the um, protocols that are able to keep everybody safe. All righty. Well, young adults. Okay, so, well, then I guess it's a good time for us to talk about some of the ways that um, everyone can stop the spread. So we have a really good question from one of our attendees that's wondering if masking up is so critical to stopping and, sl and slowing the spread, why is it not being enforced throughout the county? You do bring up a good question that uh, we struggle with in public health, especially when we are dealing with measures that impact an entire community. I think I've said it before that in public health, we are accustomed to using health officer orders, but usually it's for an individual um, and it's for a short period of time. Uh, you, most of the time we have had to use this with uh, TB, but to have to issue health officer orders to an entire county and then having to enforce those um, orders is, is a challenge. Um, oftentimes we are dependent on our law enforcement partners to help us in, with enforcement. And so for example, when we have a TB patient who breaks a health officer order, we work very closely with law enforcement um, but it was more challenging um, with COVID-19. I think part of that is because of just the uh, magnitude of having to enforce it with such a large group and also for such a long time. We've been at this for a year. So uh, very difficult and also trying to balance uh, some of the other, uh, uh, you know, people will talk, you about, talk to you about their rights and um, trying to balance that, uh, it does become difficult. I know that um, in some counties, they have tried to enforce by fining uh, for violators, but it is still very difficult to enforce even when you have that tool. Got it. Thank you for that response. And, you know, talking about enforcement of masks, you know, someone else is wondering, how long should I quarantine if I have a close contact with someone who has tested positive for COVID-19? Is it 14 days or is it 10 days? I know there's been some changes in protocol. If you could just remind us what, what it is that we're supposed to do. Uh, I'll start off and then I'll let Dr. Cohen talk about the science part of it. Um, so ideally it's uh, 14 days, but the CDC did make some changes with the recognition and the additional um, studies that have shown that uh, uh, that it, you can do it for a shorter time, 10 days, and that would be sufficient. So right now we did change our guidance to allow for 10 days, uh, but you, there are certain situations, for example, especially if it's um, a situation like a, a congregate setting where people are living very close to each other, or if you have people with um, compromised immune systems where you might make that uh, determination to keep it at 14 days. I don't know if Dr. Cohen has something to add to that. Yeah, I agree. Um, the, the evidence seems to be that you can't grow viable virus after 10 days and most normal people, um, immunologically normal people. And so, um, uh, in, in immune compromised patients, they can shed for a lot longer period of time and they can transmit what they shed. So the longer um, uh, quarantine time is warranted. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, we have a, a great question um, from a community member. Irene is wondering, is there research available on whether if you get the vaccine, um, will that prevent you from infecting others? And she's wondering if that, or they're, they're wondering if that goes along with that vaccines preventing us from actually harboring the virus at all. They're a little confused about all the information around this topic. Well, it's easy, it's easy to be confused because there's not a lot of information out there. And so a lot of what people are uh, discussing our hypotheses. So 
I'm going to, I'm trying to shorten my responses, but I end up making them longer anyhow. So um, with most vaccines for viruses, we expect that when we get immunity, we don't get infected, right? Not only do we not get disease, but we don't get infected. Um, but we don't have a lot of evidence to support that. We just assume that that's true. Um, with COVID-19, as I mentioned, it appears that maybe one or 2% of people who are vaccinated will become asymptomatic, um, asymptomatically infected, and therefore they could transmit. But I don't think it's going to make you a long-term carrier, right? So it would still be that 10-day window where you could potentially transmit. The problem being that you don't necessarily know when you got infected. And so unless there's an obvious exposure, um, you would not totally know. And again, that's the argument for continued masking. So it prevents disease. It'll keep you out of the hospital. It'll keep you out of the ICU. A small percentage of people it appears to me will get infected and could be transmitting, but that's a small amount. And as we get more and more people infected, that becomes a less and less relevant number. Got it. I think that comes back- More people vaccinated, sorry. More people vaccinated, got it, got it. That's a good distinction, thank you. Um, so, you know, I know, Rachel, in particular, you've talked to this team and I talk about our, our greater Sacramento County team that's that's plugged into this webinar about um, how Sacramento County gets some of the vaccines, but then um, other places get some vaccines as well. And so, you know, we have community members that are asking about do the same rules apply around this tiered system, no matter who get the vaccine, whether it's Sacramento County giving it out at Cal Expo or whether it's a pharmacy, is it still that we're adhering to the tiered system or does it work a little differently than that? Yeah, so everyone is, you know, following, uh, hopefully the phases in tiers and that when we do allocate vaccine to a provider, that's an expectation that we make really clear to them. Um, but, uh, you know, there, again, there's still different counties moving at different phases, uh, cases because of the population. And um, so I, I think it's hard to keep it exactly right at the exact same level, um, but we do ask all of our providers to follow our phases and tiers, and we do communicate that really clearly with them. Great. And when we talk about schools coming up next, does that include community colleges and UC teachers and CSU? It does, but we will start with K through 12. Great, thank you for that distinction. Um, so Mike, why don't we go ahead and bring back up the vaccine tiered PDF um, that is a, is a great kind of visual on where things are with the vaccine, because we have a couple community members that are interested in understanding if we could make it as big as possible. So if you're able to increase the size, it'll be helpful for um, I don't have my glasses on right now, so it'll be great to, to be able to see it big. Thank you so much. So we have a community member that says, you know, I'm under the age of 65. Um, where am I in this vaccine tier? Yeah, so those under 65, it is going to depend on whether they're working and where they're working. Um, and if they're not working, you know, that, that's a different phase in tier two. So uh, phase 1A, remember, is healthcare workers, so people working in the healthcare field, um, and also residents of long-term care and, and um, the people who work there as well. And then when you get into phase B, um, it is looking at, again, at um, occupation, but that's where we also added in the 65 and over population. So um, if, you, if you haven't gotten vaccinated in this, if you don't see uh, the, the line of work that you do in phase 1B uh, and you're not 65 and over, you're likely gonna be uh, moving on down probably into phase 1C. Um, and, you know, there are changes being made as we move through this, so um, we're, we're continuing to follow the guidance from CDPH. Um, great. Let's, let's keep this up for a second, Mike. So thank you so much for pulling it up because we have a, a, one more question. So we have a colleague, Laurel, that's wondering, what about mental health peer specialist promotores? 
um, and community health workers. Where do they fall in? So yeah, if you go back to the top, you'll see right there, community health workers and promotora. So if, if someone works in that field and they haven't been vaccinated yet, they can reach out to public health. We, we do wanna get them into one of our sites. Um, and then Mike, and if you could scroll down where uh, we list education and teachers and just kind of put your mouse there. Yep, okay. So just to repeat, that's uh, where, where what's coming next. So you see the check marks there of where we are and right underneath is kind of what's up next. Is that right, Rachel? Yes, yeah. So we're currently uh, in, phase, again, still working in phase 1A, but in phase 1B, we're vaccinating uh, people that are 65 years and older and those who work in law enforcement and emergency services. And remember, these are tremendous populations of people. So this isn't just a few, you know, few thousand, we're talking tens of thousands and in some cases, hundreds of thousands of people. So um, it, it's just going to take time, um, but we do hope, uh, as Dr. Casirier said, to open up to education soon. And, you know, we'll continue vaccinating all the phase one, the people we missed in phase 1A, working our way through phase 1B, you know, one, one tier at a time. Got it. Great. Okay. Um, so I'll ask one last question about this document before we move on to some other questions, which is, um, we have a, a community member that says, my wife and I straddle the phase 1B, 1C age requirements. Should the older one get vaccinated now and the younger one later, or should we wait for 1C and get vaccinated together? I mean, I think you should get vaccinated when, when you can. So if it's your opportunity and your time to be vaccinated, I don't think there's a reason to delay Go and your partner can be vaccinated hopefully soon after. Um, but the sooner, even if one of you can get vaccinated, that's, I think that would be fantastic. Great. Okay, Mike, you can take down the, the document. Thank you so much. Um, so we have some community members that are interested in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, can, can we provide a little bit of information? What is the vaccine? How is it different from what's been offered so far? And should folks wait? for um, that vaccine to come out? So um, all the vaccines target the same protein in the coronavirus called the spike protein. The way they deliver the material is different. So the, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are RNA vaccines. They make the genetic material of the spike protein and they stick it in a lipid coat and then that's what gets injected. The way that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has been developed is they use a, another virus which is called an adenovirus and they insert a piece of the um, coronavirus um, gene for the spike protein into that adenovirus, but it's not one that can actively replicate. It's actually a non-human primate adenovirus. Um, and that's the way they deliver the um, spike protein genetic material that then is made in the body and the immune responses um, uh, developed by the person vaccinated. So it's a different route of delivery but it's basically delivering the same thing. And so the assumption would be that they're all gonna be very similar. I think one of the advantages of the J&J &J vaccine is that it appears to be effective with one dose. Um, and it also only needs to be stored in a refrigerator which makes it a much more desirable uh, vaccine for wider distribution um, since it doesn't require a minus 70 degree freezer or for that matter, a freezer at all. Um, the data with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine suggests that it's maybe a little bit less effective than the RNA vaccines, but we have to really see the full set of data, which we'll see once they present it to the FDA, because they're 
vaccine trial was in several countries, not just in the United States. And so it may be that the variants that are circulating could have affected the ability of their vaccine to perform to the same level as the um, uh, vaccines that Moderna and Pfizer make. So in my estimation, I, I don't think, I think, again, I said this the last time I was on, I think whatever you can get is going to be good. Um, and, um, and I think the beauty of the Johnson and Johnson thing is that that's going to be just another company that's making vaccine and allows for um, a broader distribution and more rapid vaccination of the population. Um, so um, that's, that's my um, uh, opinion. But um, I think the evidence is that it's an effective vaccine. Um, it's just a different way of delivering it. Alrighty. So what I what I heard you say, Dr. Cohen, is that it's a it's a different way of delivering it. So if I think about I'm going to get in one car versus a different car, it's it's two ways to get to the grocery store, um, and that it's a requires a little less. Um, cool of an environment to be in. So we're turning off the AC in the car, maybe turn it down. Um, and then it's one shot uh, versus two shots. You don't, you don't need as much gas, right? Don't need as much gas. There we go. All right. And a little bit less effective, but what I heard you say at the end was that take any vaccine that you can get. Yeah, well, and, and don't necessarily say that it's that much less effective until you okay. see what the numbers are in the different countries and um, with the different strains of virus. Got it, got it. Um, all right, thank you. So um, we have a community member that's wondering about face shields. Um, are face shields effective? Do, do folks need to still wear a mask or is a face shield adequate? Face shields uh, are mainly there to protect the eyes and the face, but as you you uh, when you look at it, you see that there's a lot of um, open space on the sides and at the bottom. So uh, you still need to wear a face covering or a mask if you're using a face shield. Usually, the face shields are used in a clinical setting where there is a risk of more aerosolization. So um, it kind of helps to protect the eyes as well. Uh, there are people who choose to use face shields because they're not for some reason able to tolerate the, uh, the masks. But in those situations, the, the um, recommendation is that they get a face shield that also has a drape so that it takes care of um, those empty spaces where air can get around. Great. Thanks, Dr. K. Um, so uh, one of the community members, Tommy, is, is uh, wondering, before they get the vaccine, do they have to get tested? None of the clinical trials required that. We, t we test people, but we don't have the results back when we are already vaccinating them. And so, um, uh, there's no um, uh, no need for prior testing. I guess I'll just leave it at that. I would like to add though, that if someone is exhibiting symptoms, we ask that they wait until those symptoms um, are resolved before they get the vaccination. We also do recommend, and this is a CDC recommendation, if, that if somebody has just recovered from COVID-19 that they do wait the 90 days before they go for the vaccination. Okay, so if I had COVID, I should wait 90 days before I get vaccinated. Alrighty. Um, so why is it not recommended for breastfeeding women to get the vaccine? Oh. I'm, I'm not aware that it is not recommended. Um, I, I think that people are not um, 
included in trials. So there, there are a handful of groups of people that have not been included in trials, um, but that um, where the assumption is that the vaccine is gonna be safe. Um, and in some groups, it will be highly effective and some it might not. So just to run them through, pregnant women are excluded from all clinical trials, but the assumption is that it's gonna work. These are not live virus vaccines, so there's no contraindication to giving it to a pregnant woman. Um, immune compromised patients are excluded from all clinical trials. Um, because it's not a live vaccine, you can give it to immune compromised patients, but I don't know whether they're gonna get as good of an immune response and whether they will be protected from the vaccine. Um, and this is the first time I've heard that breastfeeding women are excluded from being vaccinated. I've never heard that before. Has anybody else? Well, I'm um, glad you asked the question then. A community member that did ask that, it's, it's great to kind of check that information. Rachel, is there something you wanted to add? Yeah, I was just gonna say when we do have a pregnant woman or a breastfeeding um, woman come or, or register for vaccination, we just want them to consult with their provider and make sure that's the best decision, but we absolutely support that. And if that's, um, they both agree that that's the best decision, uh, we're happy to vaccinate them. Um, so we have a couple community members that um, have family that's over the age of 65. So my 85 year old aunt and my 72 year old father have not been able to get the vaccine and they're really angry and, and concerned about that. Um, so they're wondering, you know, how can they get the vaccine for their family members as soon as possible? Um, I would just reiterate uh, signing up on our website, the survey, and um, I would encourage people that we are not done expanding the opportunities and the places that we're going to have for you to be vaccinated. This, this onboarding process for providers and the limitation of not having enough vaccine, you know, we just, we, ha we, we can't have it everywhere we want to have it, but it's growing every week and there are going to be more options and we are faithful to, to go from the list of people who, the people who email us are people who aren't able to get it. And um, when we have, again, when we have open clinics, we draw from that list and we email those people an opportunity to be vaccinated. It's a tremendous number, as I said before. So um, th there's the caveat that, you know, because you're invited, you know, we're trying we're trying to get everyone in, but it is going to take time. So, but I think getting on that list is really important so that we have your contact information. We know how to reach you. Great, thank you. And just one, uh, one clarifying point, we had uh, some confusion from uh, questions coming in. Um, Dr. Cohen indicated that you do not need a test in order to get vaccinated. So uh, emphasis on the not part, you don't need a test um, in order to get vaccinated. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry I confuse people. We do we do test in clinical trials, but we do not um, for anybody that's actually getting vaccine. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple more minutes left. So we'll take just you know a couple more questions before we close out. I'm an unhoused individual. Can I qualify for a vaccine? Absolutely. Uh, we do have a homeless task force that throughout has been uh, looking at uh, being able to provide services to the unhoused, um, uh, such as being able to do testing, looking at their, the needs that they have, uh, looking at sanitation. So as we move through the different tiers for vaccination, they will be helping us with being able to provide vaccination to that population. We also do have uh, some of our community clinics that have been providing services, uh, medical services to the unhoused and they will be able to assist as well with uh, those, the, the vaccinations. Great. Um, so the, the last question we'll take and then we'll ask Rachel, Dr. Kay and Dr. Cohen to add any concluding remarks on kind of things that have come up that you wanna make sure to share with the public is, you know, what kind of proof of occupation is required to get vaccinated? Is a work ID enough? Sure. 
yeah, a work ID is, is good enough. Great. Um, so we'll start with um, Dr. Cohen and then Rachel and then Dr. K, you can round us out. Anything else you want to share with our community members around some themes that you heard tonight? So I've been trying to type some answers into some of these things that aren't being um, uh, spoken about, but I'm not a really quick typist. And so I'm getting to some of them. Um, I will say though that um, uh, I noticed that there were a couple questions about monoclonals. So just to remind you, monoclonal is actually giving you antibodies to the spike protein. So it is um, what we would call passive immunization. When we give you a vaccine, it's active immunization. Your body is making the antibodies. Here we're giving you the antibodies. Why it's not been well publicized, I, I don't know. I think that, um, you know, some things when, there are a lot of things that are sort of happening all at once. And the big push is vaccine. And so some of the other um, therapeutic interventions are getting missed a little bit. So um, uh, again, all you have to do is ask your doc and if your um, uh, provider doesn't know anything about it, they can just contact us at UCD at very least. I don't know how the other health systems are handling it, but for people who are not linked to a specific health system, we are happy to uh, provide it to anybody who would meet criteria. And criteria are gonna be based on age and underlying conditions. Great, thank you, Dr. Cohen. And I appreciate, I see you typing in some of those answers and I, I appreciate that. Um, all right, Rachel, anything you wanna add? Yeah, sure. I would just say um, that as vaccine becomes more available, uh, we really want the community to know that we we're ready to scale up and have um, more sites and more uh, and have the current sites uh, be able to do more vaccinations. So we're ready and, and looking forward to being able to to better meet this need as um, we have more vaccine. Um, and, and please be patient if it's not your turn. And we do want everybody and, you know, to continue masking and being safe and to, um, even after vaccinated, but especially uh, until then, please um, continue to just be very cautious and, and take every precaution. Great, Dr. K? Um, we just appreciate all of the interest around the vaccine because that shows that there are a lot of people who actually want to get it. And so I think that's a good thing. And we do anticipate that the uh, flow of vaccine will increase. And so we'll be able to have more clinics. But in the meantime, we should all remember that it's going to take us a while to actually get to the point of herd immunity. So we still need to be vigilant and follow the same protocols that we've been uh, talking to you about. Use your face covering, stay six feet away from people who are not from your household. Um, avoid gatherings for, with people outside of your household, good hand hygiene, and stay home if you're sick. All of those are still very important. Great. And also get tested. Um, we have all of our yes, sites that are open and ready for you. Everyone here on the call can could walk up and go and get tested at our community testing sites. We are ready for you. Um, and with that, um, you will get a follow up email from this community conversation with a link to our YouTube um, where this session is recorded and you can share it with your friends and family or rewatch it because you had such a great time tonight. Um, and we are having these sessions every two weeks. Um, so we welcome you to, to come and um, be with us again and want to give a big shout out to all of our fabulous interpreters who make this event accessible for our diverse community members. And with that, we're gonna end our time. Thank you. Thank you.